Okay, please start, Vaishnavi. Okay, ma'am. Am I audible? Yes. Okay. So, a very warm and a pleasant good morning to one and all present here. I, Vaishnavi Raj Shrivastava, from second year EC department, welcoming everyone, our chief guest of the day, less respected HOD sir, director sir, faculty members, participants, and all the members present here. To have a present sir, so, as our chief guest of the day. We all are present here to discuss on the agenda emerging phase materials for future five day and millimeter based communication organized by the Department of Electronics and Communication Engineering, GLBITM, sponsored by IEEE UP Section India, IEEE MTTS, and IEEE APS. Technology like art is a of the human imagination said by the Daniel Bell. As all of us know we live in existing times where the pace of innovation and change is increasing rapidly. And finally, technology has emerged as the key enabler for the digitalization of society that, is, that deserves our attention since will have a tremendous impact on the way we experience our daily life activities. Let me narrate how delightful I am to welcome you all today. This event has been only possible with the presence of Dr. Tejinder Singh Sir, Director Sir Dr. Rajiv Agrawal, HOD Sir Dr. Satyendra Sharma, Faculty Coordinator Dr. Asta Sharma Ma'am, and with all the faculty members of the EC department who gave us a knowledgeable idea and helped us throughout. Now, I would like to invite HOD Sir to enlighten us with some of his words. <coughs> Good morning to one and all. I am Dr. Satyan Sarma, welcoming to all of you. Respected Chief Guest of the Day, Dr. Tayyandar Singh Ji from USA, NASA representative and scientist. Respected Director Sir, Dr. Rajiv Agrawal Sir, all faculty members, staffs, and my dear students. This day really a great day for history of my department that some scientists of NASA, which is considered to be a highest and learned organization of this universe in the field of engineering. And this could be, this we could achieve only due to one of my faculty member, Dr. Asta Sarma to manage and scientist for this department and the topic which is considered is a really a recent topic. So I am just I wanted to welcome you by some few lines of Sanskrit. I think my chief guest may not be able to understand but I will be able to translate in English or in Hindi also. In Sanskrit, somebody has said, Vidvatvam cha nirpatyam cha nab tulyam kadachan. Kyunki, Dese pujyate raja vidwan sarvatra pujyate. We should not compare the richest person with the scientist of this universe. Region, the richest person is respected in the country or in the area itself. Whereas, the scientist or learned person who is being respected all around this universe. So today, I am welcoming Dr. Tejendra Singhji, who is scientist of this universe and who is chief guest of the day. On behalf of my management, my AC department, faculty, student, staff, I heartily welcome you, sir, at this organization. EC department, it was established in the year 2005 and has achieved many goals of technology for 
this country as well as for this universe sir my department is very rich in research placement and innovative ideas so your input will be very effective for my department on which whatever topic you have suggested we could get something which will be a very very beneficial for my department so i am very much thankful to you and once again i request you that my department is organizing international conference in the month of october and i want to see you as a physically chief guest to my organization sir thank you thank you a lot thank you so much sir now i would like to invite director sir to share some of his kind words first of all good morning to all present and on behalf of the zoo management so he gets a speaker of section of the engineer and we are talking or we are having a presence of the person who is working in the highest research organization which is called as nasa so you can understand once we are once we are having uh, the persons who are working into these areas so this is the highest uh, which we say it as a learning curve which we can expect from one person his area which deals with designing modeling characterization and fabrication itself is a 360 degree aspect of any electronics engineering or any system where you have the let's say understanding of designing modeling vectorization and fabrication this is all we have to do as far as electronics and communication engineering is concerned and the topic which is related phase change material i think this is the this is the area where everybody is working and the the, the specific term which i like the most is a micro electro mechanical system once we are shifting to a alternative shifting to electric vehicles and other vehicles i think this is the key point which one has into a micro electro or mechanical system and that is the future of our engineering and this is a very relevant topic and in the coming times if we say what is the change which is happening in engineering i think this is the key word with the student and every researcher has to understand with this we are also talking in terms of a, uh, what we say environment which is which is carbon free wherein you are you are, you are using the alternative fuels and this has been envisaged that in the coming 2015 we have industries which are totally different and which will be working on these aspect of it i think this is the this is a topic which we have to understand in terms of the future industries and this is a very relevant topic and i expect from all the faculty members and student that this talk will be a very very let's say uh, what we say it as a it's a, it's eye opener for you the, the the technology which will drive our systems in future as we understand this material this will be during the process they will generate the energy which will be their their latent heat or something like that which will be converted i think this is the area which we should work on at the end i'll not take much time because uh, the 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 respected speaker is already there so i thanks the department of electronics and communication engineering for organizing this program especially head of the department and the team and the, uh, the coordinator who has conducted this program i'm really really looking forward for the talk which i understand which will be eye opener for the students thank you thank you all and once again i welcome the thank you so much sir now over to you shamli uh hi uh can you hear me It's the gender. Yes. Yes. Okay. Oh, yes. thank thank for your all your kind word. I'm I really appreciate that and really thank you for uh, sending an invite for the talk. And oh, uh, I'm like really glad to address the participant and like to share some some of these things. Uh, I just want to make a quick note here. Um, can you assign me as a presenter because I I don't see an option to share the screen. But then okay, we can start. Okay. 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 One.
please check whether yes, do I can... sure okay so before yes, I'm that, so sorry for the... uh, before that we would like to uh, invite you from one of our students will read out the profile so please stand in let us yes shamli yes ma'am our speaker for today, Dr. Tejinder Singh, is a paragon of excellence in his work and research. He has received his PhD degree with highest academic honor in electrical and computer engineering from the University of Waterloo, Ontario, Canada in 2020. He is currently a postdoctoral scholar at NASA Jet Propulsion Lab Laboratory, JPL, California Institute of Technology, Pasadena, California, USA and a research associate with the Center for Integrated RF Engineering, CIRFE, Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering, University of Waterloo, Ontario, Canada. He was a... Shamali? It's a, it's a voice voice issue. Yes, yes, yes. Shamli, you are muted. Am I audible now? Yes. Yes. yes, yes. I'm so sorry for the network issues having right now. It's raining and it's a bit difficult. Yes, definitely. Yes. Today weather is okay, yes. Please continue. His current research interests include designing, modeling, characterization, and fabrication of phase change material, PCMs, and microelectromechanical systems, MEMs, based RF devices for mi microwave and millimeter wave applications. He has contributed to the development of PCM, GETE-based miniaturized components for MM wave applications. He has developed various reconfigurable monolithically integrated circuits and components. Dr. Singh is a member of international professional bodies including IEEE MTTS, IEEE EDS, OSPE and IOP Science. He is a recipient of the Governor General Gold Medal, one of the Canada's highest academic honors for his PhD research and highly competitive and pre prestigious federal awards from the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada including a postdoctoral fellowship from 2020 to 2012. 2020 to 2022, and Vanier Canada Graduate Scholarship from 2017 to 2020. He has also received the President's Graduate Scholarship from 2017 to 2020, the Waterloo Institute of Nanotechnology Nano Fellowship from 2016 to 2017, and from 2017 to 2018. He has been awarded the Young Engineer Award from the European Microwave Association and GAAS Association in 2021 and Brian L. Barge Microsystems Integration Award from Canada Microsystems in a Canada-wide research competition. Also received the best paper work at IEEE MTTS International Microwave Workshop Series on Advanced Matter Processes in 2018. The University of Waterloo Faculty of Engineering Award six times between 2015 and 2019. He is an associate editor of Microsystem Technologies journal published by Springer Nature Germany and serves as a topic editor in MM Wave area in electronics published by MDPI. He is a receiver of many top tier academic journals including IEEE Transactions on Microwave Theory and Techniques, IEEE Transactions on Circuits and Systems 1 and 2, IEEE Transactions on Industrial Electronics. His hobbies include photography and is also a metal guitarist. He is a freelance graphic UI designer and has released two instrumental albums and one EP. Well, his achievements are so much that they cannot be just simply summed up in a few lines and pages. So now, I shamly, on behalf of faculty members and our guests, I would require, I would invite our guests to apprise us with his suggestion. So please honor us with your enlightening words. Uh, thank you so much, Shamli. I mean, definitely that was like a way too long bio. I'll try to like shorten it up for any next talk. Anyways, I, I really like, uh, thank you all for uh, this like welcome, welcoming treatment. Feels like home. Uh, so I think like without uh, we take any of the time for the participants, uh, I'll go jump right into my presentation. And let me share my screen.
Okay, so the screen is visible now, right? Right. Yes. Okay, okay. Sure. So I'll today be discussing about I'll touch on this subject like what exactly is emerging calcogenide phase change RF devices for millimeter wave applications and why do we need it? What exactly how the technology where exactly the technology is like going? And uh, so most of the pres uh, work that I'll present in this talk has been carried out at the University of Waterloo uh, in the past uh, four to five years. So the region of Waterloo, I just like talk for two or three slides from where exactly I'm coming from and uh, where exactly are we located. So this is called like the te uh, Canada's Technology Triangle. This is the North America's top emerging tech talent market. So uh, you guys must be familiar about like Toronto Waterloo Corridor. That's like having uh, North America's like largest cluster with 9,700 plus tech companies with 2,000 plus startups, 300K plus tech workers only in like a small area. So region of Waterloo has more than 1500 plus tech related businesses as per 2018 data, such as Google, BlackBerry, Teledyne, Delsa, MapleSoft, and on semiconductor. These are like few names. Uh, it's just like Hello. a little photo of the of the campus. And we are like pretty nearby in uh, top tier university, it. Toronto, Hello. McGill, Harvard, MIT, Cornell, Purdue, Illinois, uh, and all of these. Uh, and we are like the largest faculty of engineering in Canada. Uh, just a brief touch of a history of innovation. So this university founded in 1957, not very old, not very new. It's like a, a like <laughs> mediocre. So it's a, it's a very research intensive university focused mainly on engineering. That's like the founding faculty. So the co-op education, North America's first and the world's largest, uh, the program that they have. So this is uh, this university rank uh, most innovative university for 21 consecutive years. Uh, you guys must be familiar about the West Graham in 1963. There are like many uh, top tier alumni who graduated from this school. Uh, and a little bit about what exactly we do at Center for Integrated RF Engineering, or in short, SURF. Uh, so it was established by uh, uh, Professor Afetar Mansoor. He's well known for his work on RF filters and all of these devices. So this uh, it houses a class 10,000 clean room, and we have like uh, more than five clean rooms uh, on campus. So we generally do tunable RF devices, MEMS technology, phase change technology, superconducting RF devices, uh, such as like low temperature, quantum stuff as well, so filters and multiplexers. Uh, there are like few snapshots around the lab and uh, some products that we did like in the past. Okay, so enough about the university and the lab. So let's go right away into the outline. I'll talk about the motivation for reconfigurable RF components. Why do we need it? Uh, introduction principle of PCM, uh, development of this, this technology. So how can we approach towards that one? Then what exactly is a transient heat distribution? Then I'll talk a little bit about multiport switches, switch matrices, then various RF components and summary. So introduction. So why do we need such, such kind of crazy technology? So as you guys must be familiar about like, you know, this hype of 5G and then like, companies and like all these network infrastructures, they all started about start started like, you know, talking about like upcoming 60 networks while the standards are not set yet, but 5G or 5G plus. So this is kind of a one example that we have a transmitter and then there's like a array of uh, phase shifters and then we connect antenna out of it and then we have a phase array. So this is just like one niche application as you can see the radiation pattern uh, for like a beam forming and all. So passive RF components such as capacitor banks, inductor banks, tunable, uh, sorry, let me just get my laser mark pointer. Yeah, like tunable attenuators, hybrid couplers, phase shifters, impedance matching networks, to name a few, are used in a variety of applications to provide reconfigurability. Now reconfigurability is the key here, like in RF front end and all. So smaller the devices, we need to like pack really uh, like dense integration and we really need like some high performance millimeter wave devices. Now with the evolution of 5G, as I said, there is a requirement of tunable components that can operate at millimeter wave range. Millimeter wave frequency, like generally 30 gigahertz, 60 gigahertz, 28 gigahertz. I mean, like the basic 5Gs, uh, it used like sub six gigahertz frequency. Now the stringent challenges like posed by 5G and 6G, now they are like in terms of developing high performance and miniaturized component. Uh, this is an example that I already talked about. So that's like the main motivation behind that. Now, if we compare the RF switch technology, switch is really like the fundamental block uh, of like any RF circuit. 
So there are semiconductor technologies, which we can categorize as like CMOS, by CMOS, uh, gallium arsenide, so all of these kind of technology falls under this semiconductor. And then we have a MEMS, which is called micro electromechanical systems, which are like technically a mechanical component, but like on miniaturized scale. And then we have a uh, phase chain material based technology. So frequency range wise, semiconductor, we can't really push too much into millimeter wave because of like the, it's a solid state technology. So we can have like a lot of leakage concerns and all those things. While MEMS and PCM, they are pretty much good up to like millimeter wave range. Right. Insertion loss, semiconductor pretty high, and these two are low. Isolation is also, MEMS is, provides excellent isolation. This is reasonably good, but better than semiconductor for sure. And we have switching speed in microsecond, linearity very good, fab difficulty. Here's where this like technology shines. Semiconductor, we definitely need like, you know, uh, class reading like, we can't really fabricate these ones like in in-house. Uh, there are like foundries uh, for these th these things. And then like when we talk about power handling, these two like medium level power handling, monolithically integration, uh, that's like excellent choice for that. I'll explain like what exactly I mean over here. So what exactly is a phase chain material? People generally get confused about like, you know, it is something to change the phase, uh, but it's not. It's It's literally like a physical phase. Like let's say you have a candle, you heat it up, and it melts and then you have like a liquidified metal. So it's like a solid to liquid. So this is like a physical phase chain. But this materials, let's say you have germanium or antimony, and then you have like a alloy formed with the tellu uh, telluride. So either GETE or SPTE, these kind of materials are non-volatile. That means they retain its state. So with an application of heat pulse. So what we generally do here is like have embedded microheater and we apply few nanosecond high voltage pulse. High voltage, I mean like about 12, 14 volts. Uh, short pulse to go from crystalline state to amorphous state. And we can go back from amorphous state to crystalline state by applying a microsecond pulse, which is like just above the crystalline temperature. And we can go back over to the crystalline state. Now the crystalline state is the conductive state. That means it has a very low resistance, while the amorphous state has a pretty high resistance because of the arrangement of uh, atoms in the ma uh, material. So insulating conductive state, which is accomplished by an application of one single pulse, depending on how we apply the pulse. So the idea behind that is we need to melt the material and quench it right away in few nanoseconds. So that's how we achieve this phase change. So what can we do with this kind of material? Well, for RF, um, it's like a whole playground ahead of us. Like we have connective to insulating. We have some material which can do this kind of property. And uh, we can like try to design actually RF around it. Oh, by the way, like phase chain materials are known to be used in like digital memories. And yeah, do you remember like the CD, DVDs, like all those media that we use like few years back? I don't think like we use it anymore. So like op it's used for like those uh, storing data optically or like uh, in digital memories and computers. But for RF, it's pretty hot topic. So we start with like a film, uh, thin film characterization. Uh, characterization include like, you know, just a basic material one like AFM, FEM, PEM, all those techniques. So I tried to optimize this one from over room temperature, 25 Celsius, 100, 150, 200, just to get an idea that how the surface morphology looks uh, under different temperatures. So we have like crystalline or we have amorphous state. Uh, as you can see like this, these kind of cracks and void formation, those are like pretty prominent uh, at low temperature deposition, but the moment will go at higher temperature. We improve the film quality, but the grain size increase, as you can see over here, crystalline, like all of these four uh, AFM images, like the 3D image, 2500 and up to 200, as you can see, like the, the roughness basically increase. So once we get these things, these things like figured out, uh, then we move forward to like, what are the typical fab constraints that we get? So if this is a heater, I'll explain the working principle of what exactly, how this switch, switch works. So as you can see, this like a thin line going between this to this electrode, uh, this is like a, <coughs> sorry, this is like the melted region. So if I zoom in over here, like across A to A dash, so this one is the melted GET region, as you can see, like because the devices are not passivated. So the thermal balance is like a huge concern in these things because of the literally 750 degree 
uh, Celsius heat requirement over here. And you can see like these cracks formation, uh, like along the line of the microheater. So you see like the crack formation that happens. Uh, we need to avoid that. Um, then there is like a UV lithographation. So the channel size between that, like between these two electrodes, it's literally 600 nano to about 800 nano and UV lithography, we just hit the limit of UV litho uh, lithography. So we need to move for, forward with the e-beam lithography, which we can like write it uh, pretty precisely, I would say, and then alignment wise, it's good. So here you can see about like 200 nanometer misalignment, uh, which can cause like your whole wafer is gone. So these things like we need to worry about in this one. Now the development of PCM are of SPST switches. SPST stand for single pole, single throw switches. Now single pole, single throw. It's, it's a very basic uh, or the unit cell, I would say. So once we have uh, this material uh, fully optimized and we can see like it's resistance change with the application of heat. So then we can design, as I said, like RF around it kind of RF circuitry. So the first element is a switch. So in a 3D view, as you can see, like the RF board over here. So this is like a coplanar waveguide. So central conductor and the ground on the sides. So signal will flow this way or the optical image like on this to this way. And these two pads are to apply the DC pulse. So the pulse that I explained earlier. So we apply over here and the RF signal flows in this way. So with the change of resistance, as you can see, there is like a slight uh, discontinuity over here, which is like zoomed in over here in the 3D view. As you can see, like the gold material is not connected over here, which is like connected using the GTE patch. So the RF signal will flow or connect or disconnect between these two lines because it's conductive or insulating. And there are various material, uh, sorry, the design dimensions like uh, channel length or heater width or all of these things. Uh, I actually uh, presented this one in 2018 and uh, there's like a very thorough paper on TMTT uh, published in 2019 that explains like a lot of uh, design kind of steps to start with these things. Sure. So the first prototype that we uh, presented, it's like the series and shunt switches. Series switch means we have an actual discontinuity between like RF signals. So that means like over here, the line is physically cut. So this one, as I discussed in the last slide, and there's another topology that's like a shunt switches. So shunt means the line is connected, like input and output is connected all the time, but we are kind of um, heating this material over here using like the microheaters where the RF signal flows from input to the ground terminal. So this works in the opposite way. While if we look at the RF performance, these are the performance matrices, which tells us like any RF switch, kind of like where exactly it stands. Uh, while dashed line is a simulation line and this like the the light color or pinkish color uh, is the measurement data. So as you can see, like the loss is 0.3 dB up to DC to 26 gigahertz and isolation is pretty good, like about 20 dB. And while the shunt switch shows much better uh, insertion loss and isolation, but we, we did not like proceed with this one because the reliability was li literally a concern because we could not get cycles out of it. So as I said, it was a prototype only and uh, tried to improve this one, the series switch. So any switch, like any circuit that I'll be talking about, this will be the unit cell that is used uh, like in more complex circuits. So how does this in-house uh, developed Gen 3 microfabrication process flow uh, goes? This is the 3D view of a Gen 3 switch. Again, uh, input, uh, sorry, uh, RF signal goes this to this way, DC pads here. These are just the ground pads. Uh, I'll talk really briefly about it because these things are already available in paper. So it starts with the high resistivity silicon substrate sputtered with the, uh, sorry, PCVD oxide on top of that, just as a thermal insulating layer. And then there is a tungsten layer deposit sputtered, which is patterned using reactive ion etching. And then there is a, silver layer deposited on top of that, which is again patterned using RIE because these are these two metal layers. So tungsten is used as a heater and then the silver is used as a bias circuit circuitry layer underneath. Then there is an aluminum nitride layer patterned using RIE uh, and then uh, germanium telloid as an actual PCM material, which is patterned using iron milling. So between GETE and this tungsten heater layer, there is like we need like a dielectric layer in between so that we can create RF insulation, but not thermal insulation. So for RF signal flow, well, gold is the best metal. So evaporation of uh, chromium and gold and 
uh, patent using liftoff, then passivated using SAO2, uh, and then like the next metal layers, and then we have chips. So this is like kind of a eight layer microfabrication process. This is an optical image. And as you can see over here, the WH uh, or from the SEM image, or if you read the scale, like this is literally like 600 nanometer region over here and gold, gold and the GT in between. This is the 3D rendered view of the switch junction, I would say. So, I mean, the switch size is 0.5 millimeter by 0.4 millimeter, but we are only interested in this small area because that's the actual switch. Well, the rest is just like the pads to land or probes or for the measurements. So this is a switch that uh, 20 micron by 20 micron. So these switches are DC to 67 gigahertz, fully passivated, uh, compact PCM SPSC switches. Overall device size is pretty small. Loss is less than 0.45, isolation better than 17 dB. To me, like this is really, really great performance level. I'll show you the comparison with current state of the art with linearity and uh, CW power handling reported 300 milliampere current handling capacity with switching time less than 1.1 microsecond. And these switches are tested for more than 1 million reliable switch cycles. So I can say like this technology is pretty reliable and somebody like in uh, industrial like uh, from industry like they reported like a billion cycles. So that means like there is a huge interest in this such kind of technologies and uh, uh, reliability wise these are like pretty great actually. So now the measured S, uh, switch performance for SPST switch. This is kind of just a photograph of a uh, Gen 3 high resistivity wafer as you can see there are like a bunch of devices on top of that. Um, loss is pretty low, uh, 0.45 up to 67 gigahertz. Isolation is 20 dB like up to 30 gigahertz. So if we try like a different width, length, all of these like design parameters. So we get like a different R on. R on is again like a matrix, matrix of a performance matrix to judge like what is the on state performance of the switch. Lower is better, R of is higher is better. I mean, basically we need to create a huge like, you know, difference between on and off state. So just, just to get better isolation and low insertion loss. Now the power handling measurement, uh, a photograph of test setup and a couple of things over here. Uh, most of the devices that I'll be talking about, talking about in next slides, uh, these switches shows up to 35.5 dBm RF power handling. That 35.5 is equivalent to 3.3 and half watt of CW power. While like some some devices actually can go beyond 40 dBm, which is like the limit of the test setup. Uh, the Downside of that is like we lose from insertion loss, loss perspective. Like if we are okay to like have a higher loss, so we can play around with the design dimensions to have much better uh, power handling capability. And then there is like a uh, on state power handling capability. It's pretty simple. Like we have a source and connected with the RF amplifier, and uh, there is an isolator just to protect the amp and the source. Then there is a directional coupler goes to GST probes, then there is a DUT, and then there's a attenuator connected. Basically what we are doing over here, this port and this port, like these two GST probes. So we are interested in input power and output power available exactly over here. And any power that is not required, that's either attenuated as a heat, which is like goes to the match load, both directions. Now the third order intercept or IIP3 or IMD, we have a fundamental tone. We have a third order products. Uh, these points are the measured results and these are the extrapolated values. Uh, as you can see, like the input spectra, I, I generally like plays a spectrum analyzer over here, like at the input side, just to make sure our sources are perfectly clean. So these are two independent sources, as you can see over here, uh, two sources. And then we have a spectrum analyzer, which checks the output spectrum. And we like try to automate the spectrum analyzer response just to make sure that these products what we get on the side lobes or any sort of unwanted products. So we can see uh, how much is a delta P. There's a basic equation which we can convert the third order intercept point. So by varying like the tone separation between these two and then like the center frequency of that, uh, this is the worst case scenario for this, which is like the 41 dBm is the worst case scenario, but we generally get much higher than that. Now, what is the typical switching speed uh, of these devices? As I said, like there's a small pulse. Uh, I won't say like a small pulse, but like a nanosecond pulse. 
So once you apply that, the amorphous pulse, so our RF signal goes down and this is like the RF signal goes back on. So this is the off state and the bottom one is the on state. T on time is 1.1 microsecond. T off time is 275 nanosecond. Uh, 1.1 microsecond is like a little bit higher in terms of semiconductor technology, like if you compare, but like, yes, if you compare like, you know, uh, coaxial switches or MENS or all of those uh, really high performing RF devices, 1.1 microsecond is nothing really. So I try to get this performance like not just with the uh, not just with the real time score, but uh, also with the power meter just to make sure it switch fully of, uh, on state to off state. Then there's a reliability and lifetime cycles testing. So in this setup, network analyzer is connected between this DUT, like the input and output one and two ports, and it constantly monitors the RF performance change. And then there is a source measure unit connected through BIOSTs, which checks the resistance change or the DC resistance change, I would say, uh, between port one and two, which is really important. And why it is important? Because that, that dictates the R on. So because we apply like the pulse, um, like amorphous pulse and crystalline pulse. So there are two pulse generators, A and B, which is which are connected using function generator. Function generator is basically provide a trigger signal and these trigger or sync signal are connected to this programmable PSU or the power supply unit. And then there are two SPDT coaxial switches connected and there is a source measure unit over here. So what this SMU does is like, we have probes connected between three and four like a microheater, as I explained, uh, to provide the pulse. So we need to monitor the heat, uh, the resistance of the heater, which is RH, so which constantly monitors, by the way, because when you apply the pulse, the metal heats, not the PCM, but like the heater metal, which is the tungsten. So any material which heats, so it's thermal coefficient of resistance change. So we need to monitor that just to make sure our pulse generator delivers the accurate pulse to the DUT. Uh, and this is like the offstate model. So this setup is fully automated using a sync signal and constantly monitors the resistance of heater, switch, and RF performance. Uh, it's a photograph of a test setup, and I just create this like a small modular connection matrix where we can disconnect and connect any sort of equipment as we as we like. So amorphous pulse, crystalline pulse. Uh, this is like the measured 1 million device cycles, no point of failure seen, and the test setup has to be truncated because it's 72 hour test time. On state resistance, off state resistance over 28 hours duration. Uh, this is like pretty amazing results compared to uh, various other technologies available. Now, comparison with current state of the art, all of these results, measured results, are taken from manufacturers directly, like let's say, there is silicon SOI, ultra CMOS SOI. These are like the PCME or analog devices or Melo Micro, or you can say, I don't have like the company name over here, but these are given in one of the paper, I think TMTT. So this is the performance of SP3D switch, uh, this red one. So as you can see, like compared with the competition, this technology really outshines at higher frequency. I mean, like really 30 gigahertz. I don't see any other technology that really like reaches at this, like we want low insertion loss that that goes like as low as possible. Um, there is like only one, this PSEMI, I think that's called Ultra CMOS SOI based RF switch that comes pretty close. Uh, that works up to like 60 something, maybe like 67 gigahertz. Uh, or maybe 60 gigahertz, but still like PCM shows much better performance. Isolation wise, even at higher frequencies, much better. Well, yes, if our application is less than 10 gigahertz, 12 gigahertz, there are other technologies available. Now, like in terms of uh, frequency range, chip or die size, control voltage, switching time, linearity, power handling, this green color or the blue color is like the best case scenario this red one is like the worst case scenario. So where are we? Where do we stand like compared to other technologies? Like frequency wise, great. Chip size, die size is great, really small. Control voltage, 
yes you would see like really low number but i put a footnote over here because this these, this is like the latching technology latching means like once you apply the pulse you don't really need a constant power supply so that means there is zero static dc consumption while all the other silicon or mems type of technologies you really need to connect the power all the time and then there is like insertion loss why is it's good so just like the highlight with other technologies so heat distribution PCM, which is like a biggest concern. Most of the people ask like, you know, oh, well, there is like a lot of heat that's, uh, that we need to inject in that. What about like the overall system temperature or what about like the crosstalk, thermal crosstalk, like because these switches are placed in a really close vicinity. So uh, how can it, these switches actuate the other nearby switches? So this would clarify like, why not? Uh, for the first time ever, like a thermal imaging has been done for really high speed refractory microheaters, which means like if we have a really small tungsten uh, microheater made up of tungsten or refractory metal, uh, well, I would say like, okay, simulations, you can do simulations like in a console we have, ANSYS or all of those simulation softwares. But one thing to note over here, whenever we do certain simulation, experimental data is always like, you know, um, it always, I think like it is uh, kind of val validate all of those results because let's say if you try to simulate this, these results, you can easily simulate that. But there are various factors, let's say resistance of the material or you can say surrounding temperatures. Uh, there are various thermal coefficients like what is the heat flow or convection or convective cooling all of those things so we don't really know we can take those values from the literature but they don't really map good with the experimental data so experimental data gets get us like you know accurate information and in this case it's the exact same case we try to experimentally validate this data because simulation earlier didn't make sense so we try to map this one and then we reverse engineer the simulation coefficients kind of uh, then we proceed with the more complex heater designs so now let's say if this figure A is, uh, this is really like a diced switch, uh, fully uh, passivated, ready to test on a tip of a finger. As you can see, like this is really, really, really small, like half a millimeter size die. Uh, so if we have this as a 3D view, we are interested in this small portion, like when we need to simulate, we don't really need to simulate this whole thing because it's just like the pads. So this small portion because this is a symmetrical device so we can make a quarter piece model of that and we have all the layers as per like the fab process that i discussed so based on these materials uh, i generally what i what i generally do with any sort of like engineering design is like never use the same values which are for ideal materials like uh, conductivities and all those things always like ex experimentally measure that and then use those values just to make sure simulations are accurate um, this dash line is the GED or the PCM material. So at different different time frames, as you can see, like uh, the heat flows maximum at 195 nanoseconds because we apply the pulse as per our bias signature. So and then the heat flows towards the top. So this just gives us more insight into what sort of thermal balance are we looking at in this really tiny portion, like which is five micron or something like in, in one quarter. So we have this thermal crosstalk investigation where, sorry, yeah, the CCD image, the thermal image. So this shows and, um, you know, clarify a lot of lot of the questions that, you know, if at different temperature, uh, at, sorry, at different voltages, the heat gets but generated over here. I agree close to 730 degrees or 750 degrees, but the heat is very, very like or highly localized in that 20 micron region. Even this, these are like thermal me uh, thermal measurements uh, 3D plots, even if the heat goes cl close to like 800 degrees Celsius, it just stays really in that small area. So that means if we place a switch in nearby area, like that won't get affected un until and unless definitely we apply a lot of voltage to it. So this is like a cross section of the same heat, A to A dash. Um, this is, this shows like when will it make, a, uh, when will it like, you know, show some problem, like if we apply too much voltage. Well, the, um, what I'm suggesting is like 200 nanosecond, 12 volt, 1.2 microsecond, 8 volt. This is for amorphous pulse and crystalline pulse. Uh, we still stay uh, inside like that 16 micron region 
while it expands to 160 if we go to 15 volts. So this small three volt can make like a lot of difference. Now, while the switch is established, we compared with the state of the art, what exactly we can do, like not just switches, like what really, uh, we have a lot of things which we can do, such as multiport switches and switch matrices. So we have this basic element as a switch. So we have RFC signal over here. Well, actually I'll show you like the next slide. Uh, maybe, okay, we'll talk about this one. So we have this a common signal over here. We can route this signal to RF2 or R, sorry, RF1 or RF2. So signal can go between RFC to RF1 or it can go from C to RF2. Similarly, it can go from C to 1, C to 2 or C to 3. In from common, this is like a common signal. So it can go to 1, 2 or 3, not like simultaneously. Otherwise, we are just like creating kind of a power divider circuit over here. Uh, this is this is called SPDT or SP2T switch where single pole two throw. This is SP3T single pole and triple throw. So uh, this one is also recently uh, uh, I presented this one like DC to 30 gigahertz transfer switches. What does it mean by transfer switch? Transfer switch stands for if you have like a four port terminal, a four port sorry device. Let's say this one on the left side or the uh, this guy over here. So we can route the signal between port 1 to 4 and 2 to 3 simultaneously, like 1 to 4, 2 to 3, or 1 to 2 or 3 to 4 simultaneously, like state 1 and state 2. This is called like a C-type transfer switch. And it has like four SPST switch. Uh, if you remember, like this is a really basic single pole, single throw switch over here, 1, 2, 3, and 4. Uh, while this R-type switch is like similar functionality state one state two but can provide additional functionality state two to four that means like port two to port four uh, we have additional path so these these switches provides kind of a reconfigurability um, and then this is the measured and simulated data where you can see like the isolation and non adjacent uh, adjacent ports isolation for the non adjacent ports and then the measured insertion loss, which is like still less than 1.5 dB in a worst case scenario, up to 30 gigahertz and the return loss. Now, if you look at like the RF power, uh, on state power handling, off state, uh, figure of merit uh, at 20 degrees Celsius and 85 surrounding temperature um, cycling, and then resistance change over switches. So the RF performance measurement of SPDT, SP3D switches uh, I'll basically like switch the uh, skip through a little bit over the performance uh, because I have like a few other devices to cover as well. Uh, this is like a scalable two by two switch matrix unit cell where it looks like a transfer switch but has uh, additional states. Let's say it can also do one to four, two to three, and one to three, two to four. So it can do like the cross type of structure. So we can do two by two switch matrix. Uh, isolation, it's, it's perfect. Isol uh, sorry, insertion loss is less than 1.5 dB. So what is the application of such kind of uh, such devices? Like it has six SPST switches arranged in a way and definitely like all of these discontinuities are fully uh, optimized uh, using simulations. So input and output. So between these two, we this is like a traditional approach where we put like SPDT switches and we can connect filters or resonators or antennas or whatnot, like any device can go over here. We can either bypass this path, like go from the top or can include this filter one in our in between input and output or can include filter two or filter one and two, so or none. So it is called like a binary kind of approach. Uh, we can reduce the number of switches if we use this instead of SPDT switches. Uh, so we are kind of saving space and we are reducing number of switches, less number of failure points or something in our path. Uh, this is like one application. So this is based on that application. This is like a resonator one, resonator two, and a fully integrated, monolithically, integra uh, monolithically integrated, uh, everything like on the same way for we can actually design anything over here, like not just a resonator. Resonators are just like as a proof of concept kind of thing. So return loss, we can tune between RF input and output. Like either we can have resonate uh, resonance at F1, F2, F1 and F2 simultaneously, or no uh, 
what is it called like sorry resonance now the dc to 67 gigahertz t type switch uh this one is like a holy grail of a, a really small kind of four port compact rf device which we can route the signal between any available port uh, loss is pretty small and isolation is more than 26 db so this one uh, can also do one to four, two to three, or this state two, or it can do like state three and four. This one is much better than C and R type switch because it has additional paths, but definitely it has more number of switch. C and R type has like, I believe like minimum four switches, but this one has 12 switches. So the configuration of that is a little bit different and definitely has more discontinuities. Uh, this is the optical micrograph. So again, like, let me emphasize over here, this is the again same SPST switch, but designed in a way like all of these small switches to make like really uh, a nice product out of it, kind of like a T-type switch. Uh, 1.6 dB, well, less than 1.5 dB loss, up to 67 gigahertz uh, return loss and isolation. Similar to that, like why we design this T-type switch? Now, what is the application of that? One application is that the redundancy switch matrix. So this basketball type of symbol is a T-type switch. So let's say we have for deep space networks or let's say in a satellite communication or something where we generally have like spare uh, receivers or in between like any sort of device in between. So we have this redundancy matrix over here like this uh, dashed boundary. So we have two matrices and connected back to back. So if any, like, you know, any point of failure, we can route the signal from that one to, let's say, if D3 and D5 fails, we have these pair receivers, and within one microsecond, we can reroute the signal uh, just like that. So this is kind of a redundancy matrix approach. So this is a fabricated device with 10 ports, and uh, this is like a T-type switch over here. So there are four T-type switch cascaded. Uh, this, this is the RF performance return loss, insertion loss, and isolation. Now, there are other types of RF matrices, like 4 by 4 cross bar switch matrix, where we have all these inputs on one side and outputs at the bottom side. So we can route the signal from any available input port to any available output port. Uh, just like that, the SPDT or the unit cell. So SPDT is simple, like 1, 3, 1, 2, 3, or 1, 2, 2, while the unit cell is one to three, uh, four to two simultaneously, or one to two, like as a turn state. Uh, I think I had one, that's fine. So we can actually route the signal, let's say from in, it goes like this path and can turn from here to the bottom. Or we can just go like in to out, in to out two, in two to out one or out two. So this is like a basic two by two. So based on that, we can do four by four or because this is like a scalable. And again, uh, this is this technology is non-volatile. So we have like various longest path in between where we can throw the signal between input to output. These are all the control pads on the sides. Then we can have these type of switch matrix where we have like this one is I believe 16 by 16. And the area is like two millimeter by two millimeter only like these, these have uh, I think 64 SPST switches. Uh, this this one over here, GT switch. Now with reconfigurable PCM based passive devices. Now sw switch switches are done like multiport switches, and we covered that. Switch matrix we covered that. Now what are various other type of passive RF components? First one is like the six bit latching PCM capacitor bank. So capacitor bank is like we have six capacitors, MIM capacitor, metal insulator, metal, uh, metal insulator, and metal. So MIM over here. So these each consecutive uh, MIM capacitor is double in a value. So one input port. These are the control pads. So as you can see, like a simulation and RF results, we can really tune the capacitance value uh, using this really small device. So this includes six RF switches, and this is literally like. 300 micron by 300 micron, including this RF port as well in that. Then we can have 
28 gigahertz variable attenuator where we can have this SPDT or SP2T switches connected back to back. And we can design like this type of, um, what I should call like a bridge resistive network or so. So we can have either this attenuator bypassed or load load this like, you know, bit. I would call it like a bit as a dashed line. So we can load this attenuator to induce some, lo induce some loss into it. I won't say like loss kind of attenuation into it. So we can have 3 dB, 6 dB, 9 dB or 18 dB. Um, we can have multiple of these uh, instances, like we can have 3 plus 6, 3 plus 9, 18 plus 9 plus 6 plus 3. So we can have any sort of combination. That's why it's called 4 bit. So we have a total of 16 combination. So all of these resistor values and impedance values are, cho are chosen just to make sure that these are implementable, like monolithically. As you can see, this image, um, optical micrograph, all of these resistor bits are designed using tungsten micro uh, uh, thin layer. These are called like the micro resistors, I would say. And then there is like a, some capacitive coupling going on just to reduce the inductive effects. Uh, simulator results measured. So this device like pretty unique, actually, like one millimeter in size, and it can tune uh, at 28 gigahertz, I mean, like over this whole bandwidth from uh, roughly like I would say 4 dB to 36, 37 dB, like pretty linear response. The return loss is really great, like beyond uh, more than, sorry, 20 dB. Similarly, we can do millimeter wave scalable variable attenuator. If you remember, like I discussed this T type switch a few slides back. So we can use that redundancy matrix approach in the middle and use the same, these three, six, nine, 18 dB bits organized or arranged in a way with the multi-port switches. So we have input and output and route the signals like this way. So we can reduce the number of switches compared to this one. We reduce the number of switches and we have redundant paths. Uh, this is like a three bit attenuator uh, measured results from let's say at 30 gigahertz, 5 dB to 26, 27 dB and the return loss. Then we can have Phase shifters. Now the phase shifters are pretty crucial. If you remember, like my uh, first or second slide, I believe, which I talked about, like you know, we can have a phase array for the beam forming kind of thing. So phase shifters are really crucial over here. Uh, well, there are like other um, other applications as well for the phase shifters. So most of the phase shifters, the biggest problem is like insertion loss. Like it varies a lot because for the TTD, like the two time delay kind of phase shifters. So because the line lengths vary. Uh, to generate the delay uh, or generate basically like changing the phase. So insertion loss variation is like a huge concern. So here what I did like try to change the thickness of the line so that we call it like a loss compensated. So we have this reference line that is going between input and output and then there are like bunch of uh, multi-port switches connected in between and we have a different lengths of line 20 degree 40 degree electrical length line like 60 and 120 any combination of that so these are called like the loss compensated transmission line so that just to make sure that this 20 degree line shows the same level of um insertion loss uh, for like the 120 degree line and for the reference line because these are like the shortest paths so i try to induce intentional loss between that just to make sure that the loss stays uh, kind of consistent so as you can see, like this insertion loss for various different states, I, I, would, I would say like the, all of the states that's possible for a three bit phase shifter, uh, they are pretty confined and the plus minus is plus minus insertion loss average is pretty small. Uh, return loss, all well, these two are the dashed line simulation results, but the measured result like this is really beautiful, like all the pretty linear phase shift at 30 gigahertz over. Uh, okay, so this is like eight gigahertz uh, bandwidth and the group delay. Now, based on that, we have this uh, kind of crazy looking loss compensated three bit millimeter wave phase shifter as well, like where we have like SP80 switch. And again, let me emphasize that there are like eight switches kind of, this is like a PCM SPSD switch. So we have eight switches arranged in a way uh, so that we can have input side connected back to back and various delay lines going underneath and the routing going uh, using a silver metal so it shows 180 degree phase shift over 8 gigahertz wide band uh, bandwidth. Loss compensated phase shifters, average insertion loss less than 3.8 dB. This one has even less loss variation. Uh, while the phase shift is not that flat 
like this one, but has a little bit more phase shift and then a group delay. And then we can have the impedance matching networks. Like uh, if you remember the capacitor banks, so now again, I start from why we need this material, why we need the switch, just to make the switch, then why we make the switch, just to make compl more complex you know, devices. So we use switches with MIM capacitor to make capacitor bank. Now we included this capacitor bank with a CPW line integrated fully in the ground planes of a CPW line just to have the impedance matching networks. Now, what exactly are impedance matching networks? If you remember, uh, you know, when you hold your phone like uh, with certain orientation, your signal drops because you're holding it in a way that, you know, some corner like it's covered with your hand, which includes resistance, uh, antenna problem. So all of those things or even like just to put it in a technical form of way, just to match the impedance of let's say antenna or amplifier kind of. So this is like automated kind of way to reconfigurable, sorry, kind of way where we can match any impedance over to like the center. We can just generate the complex conjugate of that. So as parameters with respect to frequency, these are designed for sub six, sub six gigahertz 5G band. Well, in summary, I would say what I discussed, uh, let me see, okay, 32. So what I discuss is optimize three generation of in-house uh, PCM microfabrication process and reliable PCM GT based RF switches for millimeter wave applications are developed with uh, exceptional RF performance with certain number of, I would say one million switch cycles endurance. PCM switches are tested extensively for on the basis of power handling, intermodulation distortion, switching speed, self-actuation, current carrying capacity. Thermal imaging is discussed uh, to investigate the switch actuation crosstalk, heat profile, hotspots, and to mitigate reliability concerns. Now, various multipole switch configurations are shown, including SPDT, 3D, uh, 8T, 16T, which we used for, you know, in phase shifters. Scalable switch matrices are discussed, including four port scalable switch matrix, four by six redundancy matrix, T type switch, four by four crossbar matrix, and up to 16 by 16. Uh, I mean, again, this is like a holy grail of our matrix, crossbar switch matrix. So based on these switches, uh, basic switches and multiport switches, uh, various uh, components are designed using such as band rejection, switch matrix, capacitor banks, attenuator, phase shifter, impedance matching network. So as you can see, like uh, we actually worked a lot on this technology just to generate like a whole kind of uh, a library of components. Uh, like sky is the limit in this one, like what we can't do with this one. We we have this like whole uh, field ahead of us where there is like still a lot of room for improvement. And uh, I think like you might like something out of it. Uh, I would skip that. This is just like a summary of various devices which are discussed. Uh, this is my contact information. If somebody wants to reach out to me, if I, having any concerns, contact uh, regarding any kind of any sort of questions or comments concerned. Either you can mail it over here at my URL address or JPL address uh, or on LinkedIn over here. Uh, and that's all. I thank you everyone for even for your invitation and the participants who listen to me, bear with me and uh, I can take uh, questions right now. Thank you. Good morning, sir. Good morning, sir. I'm, I'm Dr. Sarma. Uh, hi. Hi, Dr. Uh, Actually, I have one question because sure. my field area is microwave. So uh -huh. I have, a whatever you have taught in microwave, that uh -huh. already, it was already in our syllabus, that is all as a conventional tube. Uh -huh. All four ports switch and all, we have seen T in microwave conventional tube. True, true. Sir, so only one question in uh -huh. SPST, what we have studied, that is a NASA research only we could find. The uh -huh. semiconductor devices at high frequency, it uh -huh. behaves just like an insulator, what we uh -huh. are using in warfare. Uh -huh. So if we are using 70 gigahertz or 80 gigahertz, I think uh, mm -hmm. whether this performance of semiconductor will deteriorate or it will remain same. No, 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 because most of the semiconductor kind of, because, okay most reliable ones or the one which are already implemented like those are cmos based well cmos various other technologies similar to the similar to the one most of the semiconductors nowadays yes they are kind of very competitive but like 
because of leakage concerns like the channel uh, you know dimensions fat dimensions and the process kind of limitations they do not work at high frequencies because they are r on increase sorry not the r on increase i would say like uh, poor linearity and poor power handling capability while well, they are reliable so there are like certain aspects which are really great in terms of cmos or solid state devices but definitely for millimeter wave uh, they still need some catch up uh, like for 60 gigahertz 30 gigahertz or so well but most of the commercial application let's say for satellites or so uh, the most reliable ones are the like i mean um, you already were pretty much familiar with all the coaxial and waveguide kind of things so those are like the most uh, performance oriented kind of devices the only disadvantage is bulky and uh, switching time is like pretty high Oh, so nice to uh, listen a voice from you because uh -huh. we used to study SPST, SPDT, but we never see what configuration it is. And today it is a really mind blowing. I'm so uh -huh. happy to see your slide, ki how this SPST and SPDT or DPDT was looking like. And your <laughs> design is a really, uh, it is a great concern to me particularly that I have seen how to switch my design. I'm very much thankful to you because I want that somebody else should also ask question because I have many questions in microwave, but I am handing over to somebody else also. <laughs> sure. No, or no, sir, no. a request, only one request I'm, um, uh, from sure. me and from my department, even my director sir is sitting, he's also from electronics background. And uh, so he's a very good researcher in this field. And uh, so he's just to see he's very keenly watching your slide and all. So sir, um, our request from department is we are going to have some international conference in the month of October end. Uh -huh. Do you have any program to visit this country so that you can be my guest speaker in international conference? I want to invite you today itself so that you can plan from till today. <laughs> Sure. No, really, uh, I appreciate that. Uh, for sure, like we can discuss that over the email. I think uh, any plans to get related to that. Uh, really appreciate the invitation. Thank you. So, Thank you very much, sir. Like, Thank based you, on sir. the dates and everything, like we can uh, definitely like uh, talk more over the email. Thing. Okay. Thank you, sir. Right. I, I, I think there, there are some other questions which has been posted sure. by the uh, audience. So I, I, I think we can take yes, that. Um, that is uh, on the chat box. I have one question. So I just, uh, hello. I think uh, all of you, please, uh, please write it in the chat box. We we'll take these questions one by one. Thank you so much, sir. Now I request the audience to ad address the queries. Shamli, please oh. overtake. Uh, sir, the very first question we have is from Sonia, and her question is. What is conclusion of thermal simulation with respect to time of quarter slab? How it relates with thermal balance? Okay, let me go back over here one moment. Okay, let's say. So what we are trying to do over here is like, uh, let me get my laser pointer here. Yeah. So why we first of all why we need the quarter simulation of this model. So because, as I said, like all of these things are the pads just to like the land the probes. If if I can show you like the measurement slide, uh, I think you can see this monitor over here, like this small one, uh, these GSG probes on the sides, and then they're like a DC probes uh, to provide the pulse or something. So all of these, like the bigger area, they are only just to accommodate these probes and all. But the real actual switch is only this small portion, this 20 micron area. So we are only interested to model the actual switch, not really to, you know, put more computing or uh, concerns or something, you know, not to stress like this computing power. So this thing, that's why, because it's like a symmetrical model, like based on the design, uh, we can dissect it into four parts and then we can define these, this plane and this plane as a symmetry plane. And then once we like have the results, so it can like, you know, extrapolate that data. and more or less we are only interested in looking at this mid portion that how the heat flows in a z direction so that's why there is like a quarter model and regarding the thermal balance uh 
in my like earlier fabrication, like I explicitly said that it's like a Gen 3. Uh, there are like multiple fabrication process flows that I tried. So we need like a certain thickness of material, certain, certain thermal connectivity because heat flows from the heater towards the top or wherever like, you know, higher thermal connectivity is. So we certainly do not want the heat to be sucked up by the substrate, but the heat to flow through the GT. So this is kind of the idea of all these simulations. And as I said, because heat thermal simulations are pretty complicated, like if you do not know the coefficients. So that's why we did the experimental data. Uh, uh, hi, uh, I'm Sonia. I, I, I'm not just uh, uh, getting much in that, but can I ask one more question in that itself? Sure, sure. Yeah, so uh, you can see here in the timing, like zero nanoseconds to you are coming to 240 nanoseconds. And there uh -huh. is, I think, uh, at the corner where you're saying the G direction. So 195 nanoseconds timing. So with, with respect to timing, the heat variation is something like at uh, 195, it's getting uh, high or it's kind of maximum heat. Uh, I, I can see here. Right. So, uh, what is the conclusion here? Like, uh, we are reaching, we are going back in the, I mean, 240 nanoseconds as well, but we are not able to get the high temperature and we are getting at 195. So, I, I just want to know what is the conclusion comes here, like we are oh, getting at 95. Okay, okay. Because, because these are transient simulations. So, these are not the steady state simulations. So, because it's transient simulation, we want to see as per the time. As you can see, this figure subset of E, like I applied 200 nanosecond pulse where it, it sharply like, you know, drops at close to, because there's like a fall time. So here, like, you know, pulse starts from here and it starts to heat up and then like it heats over here at maximum and then we remove the pulse. So then it starts cooling down. We are also interested in looking at where exactly the heat goes. So that's why I'm just showing over here, like till 240. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, sir. Uh, the succeeding question we have now is from Sandeep, mm -hmm. and it says uh, there are two questions. How mm -hmm. do you compare the PCM switches with conventional MEM switches, and uh, can the reconfigurable switch you showed be used to replace switch filter banks used in EW receivers? So, okay, as I said, like over here in my first few slides, there are various advantages of MEMS and PCM has certain advantages. Like it's not like we can't really have a single technology that can like, you know, hit all the corners or something. So MEMS, like I personally do MEMS as well. I, I did not show any sort of MEMS devices, but I have made tremendous like uh, reconfigurable MEMS devices. So the advantage of MEMS, I would say you can get extremely low loss. I mean, again, depending on what type of MEMS are those. Uh, isolation great rf performance is i mean like really excellent because it's mechanical kind of uh, switching the only problem is like the switching speed well we can still uh, compensate for that but uh, packaging is like the main concern so we did like some wafer level packaging as well but still like you know there are like lot many uh, fabrication complexities and then uh, thermal shock and all of these so it all depends on application to application like if your application is okay maybe you can accommodate mems you need like really really great rf performance well yeah there are various technologies available but are you require like really high reliable kind of device well for commercial applications let's say uh, any sort of like network applications or so we always look for uh, reliable technology like mems is definitely even till now if you uh, if you know like only analog devices and mellow micro, they could only, uh, you know, commercially uh, sell those uh, MEM switches like SP4D or something, which shows like 3 billion cycles. But the research has been going on MEMS like since early 2000s. It's been like two decades, but still there are not many commercial companies which could actually make these ones. So that's where we stand at. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, the upcoming question is from Girdhari and mm -hmm. it says, is it possible to control RON and ROF resistance of switch? If yes, how and which parameters? Uh, sorry, the question like means how to control R ON and R OFF resistance or what? 
can you repeat the question again sorry uh, is it possible to control r on and r off resistance of switch if yes how and which parameter well okay so r on and r off because as i said we are latching the switch in either crystalline state or the amorphous state so two states over here again any switch on state and off state doesn't matter technology so in this case r on is like when it is like in a crystalline state r off is when it's in a amorphous state so then there are like other factors like these two are not the only parameters which dictate the performance r on yes i would say like if it's a series switch then yes for sure it's like the let me just go back to the circuit model let's see over here uh well because there is like a heater going underneath so if the switch is in a crystalline state so how to put it in a crystalline state by applying a pulse then we can get r on but then there is like a capacitance also you know uh included with that like all the parasitic capacitances and all so this is like one major capacitance which is like between the electrodes that gets you r off now to control r on and r off you definitely need to have pulse which you will apply between port 3 and 4 but if you're talking about can we control analog wise like between r on and r off we can have like analog tuning well no that we have for that kind of te technique, we need different technology, and we have those type of technologies available. This is like kind of a binary on or off. It's a switch. Uh, so we have one more question from Sandeep, and it says, uh -huh. is there a limit on frequency coverage of these switches? Can it be extended to sub MMW bands like 140 or 220 gigahertz? without too much degra degradation in insertion loss and isolation performances. Okay, so for like, let's say 110, 140, 220, uh, 220 gigahertz or so. So this equipment, because these switches are measured for 67 gigahertz because we use like the PNAX that, uh, okay, I don't have the photo for that. Anyways, so that's like, I tested personally for 67 gigahertz only, which is for most of the applications, uh, which is pretty great because we don't work in terahertz frequencies or more than 100 gigahertz. But simulation shows because, okay, if you think about it, if we predict the performance, I would say, uh, it's like a resistive switch, uh, just like a piece of material which provide insulation or resistance. So based on the simulations, this like loss that is going downwards, that's, that's because of the inductance of the switch. This is not, this is not the de-embedded performance. Uh, I actually have one paper on TMDD which shows the de-embedded performance of that 20 micron uh, switch. While the performance is pretty consistent, or I would say like pretty linear, there is no kind of uh, roll off because of inductance. So for sure, we can extend the frequency range. Now the question comes, how about the isolation? Because these materials are like, you know, as I said, 600 nanometer uh, channel length or so, so your isolation would decrease. So have to think about something to tweak the geometry or something like that that can extend the frequency range. But for sure, uh, Teledyne Scientific actually presented one switch, I believe, in 2016. That is not on GET, but on vanadium oxide material. Uh, while showing the performance at 200, I think like 240 gigahertz or something. So definitely worth checking out that paper. Uh, uh, I don't like really recall if there is any other paper on either MIT or PCM materials, uh, but definitely, yes, the performance can be extended. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, one more question by Nasimuddin, and it says, any study of temperature effect on these phase change devices? Because are there any study of temperature effect? It's his question. Uh, there are like a lot of studies because as I said, these Phase chain materials are not new. Well, for RF, yes, these are new, but for optical applications, for memory applications, there has been like tremendous amount of studies which are, you know, uh, in the literature, like people have studied that there are like books available, uh, especially on phase chain material. Well, if you look for material side of view, uh, you will find like a lot of details. But this one, like a uh, few slides of thermal, which I am like showing in my talk, that is, only targeting RF switches, but definitely there are a lot of resources available. Okay, sir. So, uh, a question by Follow Me. It uh -huh. says NEMS is also today's trend 
can this work also can be substituted by that technique and what changes can we expect from that i actually didn't get that question like first few words what you said like it's n says something I, i didn't like really n follow that n e m s is also today's trend can this work also be substituted by that technique and what changes can we expect from that okay no offense but like uh i did some nems as well so nems nems is not really different it's just like the micro scale or nano scale kind of thing well even till now if you look at literature i haven't seen like anybody could demonstrate like demonstrate a really great performing device for at nano scale yes maybe in future but like this nano hype it's been like for many years like uh, people have been claiming that yes we can do this 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 that uh, but the real results is like uh, I, i don't see much but maybe in future there must be some different materials or something people can investigate that uh, it's only like to push push it further but definitely if the materials like you know the feature size shrink we are losing at power handling linearity and various other things but as i said mems and nems they are kind of equivalent only the difference in scale like sorry the microscopic level scale uh, the reliability concern will still stay the same same uh, thank you sir one mm-hmm. more question uh, what is temperature range for these switches they can sustain uh is it like the surrounding temperature or is it like the what what sort of temperature like uh, that uh, presenter sorry the participant is asking for okay so let me ask the participant for this uh yeah hi uh, i i can just interrupt you uh huh yeah so the question is like uh, when like kind kind of heat generation right happens inside the when we have the in use that switch right so what is the max or min temperature range we can have for for such kind of switch sure 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 so it it all depends on like you know depending on what type of heat heat rule that you design uh, for this germanium telluride material uh, we require we need to okay as i said we need to melt the material and quench it like right away within few nanosecond like about 100 nanosecond or so so we required like the melting temperature for gd is close to 730 degrees celsius uh so you can predict based on that well if we tune the ratio for germanium let's say we go by 30% germanium and 70% telluride we can tweak this temperature probably but that's about this scale Thank you sir. Good morning sir. We have uh, questions from our uh, students as well. Uh-huh. So uh, Shivangi Good morning sir. Am I audible? Yes yes. Uh first of all sir this was very informative session so thank you for sparing your time. and sir uh, my question is like uh, all these the core and enable technologies that are there will be associated with the 5g or more upper part of the network so sir the confidential information that are there will be uh, means moving at all layers in the future of the wireless system so sir your views i would like to ask means uh, get your views on the sir security as well as the privacy concerns thank you oh uh, well, what if you talk if you talk about like you know all these like privacy concerns and all okay first of all i won't able to answer that because my work i don't work in uh, network layer or network infrastructure kind of thing that's like more of a software kind of things i mainly work on device side material side and microwave side so based on like when you when you say like you know there are some uh, you know internet of things iot kind of things and all uh, well yes <laughs> it's <laughs> I I really don't really want to go into this uh this things becomes a lot political basically like you know there are different views of different people I don't want to express any of my views on these kind of things Uh yeah sorry boss no I won't Okay sir thank you sir Next question Uh, 
हेलो सर आई एम सन्ना सिंह सर एक्चुअली आई हैव अ क्वेश्चन दैट यू आर पॉइंटेड ऑन द एम एम ई एम एस एज कम्पेयर टू द सेमी कंडक्टर बट वेन वी टॉक अबाउट द स्पीड दैन एम ई एम एस स्पीड हैज अ लेस एज कम्पेयर टू द सेमी कंडक्टर बिकॉज सेमी कंडक्टर स्पीड इन नैनो एंड एम ई एम एस इन माइक्रो स्पीड सो वेन वी टॉक अबाउट द फाइव जी द स्पीड मैटर्स अ लॉट सो वॉट यू सेट अबाउट दैट पॉइंट so is your question is related to like why the mems has like lower speed uh, and semiconductor having like the a faster speed or something is it that's what you are asking yes sir uh, because uh, we all know that uh, we are moving to the 5g it's because of uh, speed uh, some main factor of the speed is uh, uh, going up best in future upcoming because uh, uh as we move uh, further in future there is a lot of technology or a communication speed matters a lot like any information sure 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 so okay there are two things like uh first of all is not to get confused between the switching speed and the actual network speed because that's like we are talking about frequency domain and then like you know if you talk about higher frequencies or something because that provide us like you know higher bandwidth better data rate or something that's the speed i think you are talking about but if you're talking only about like the switching speed because you need to change the channels or something i agree like we definitely require something in nanosecond range uh but at this moment like if we talk exactly as of today uh i don't see like many uh either commercial companies or uh yes there is like a research going on uh the ideal ideally we should have in nanoseconds but yes the word is not ideal so we have to compromise somewhere so either so that okay that's another reason that why do we have this sub 6g kind of bands like for 5g because we have a lot of uh, choices available where we can have like faster switches and all those things well for millimeter wave let's say more than 30 60 gigahertz yes i mean you would see that it's not viably available and i don't see like in next coming years that will be maybe it will still take 5 6 years so it still requires some work on that okay sir thank you sir mm-hmm. hello sir uh huh sir my question is that um, will 5g produce much higher exposures to rf feeds than other mobile phone technologies uh okay there was actually uh like a huge panel discussion on a health risks on 5g that was on mtd again that's a very personalized question okay i can maybe express only my personal point of view i'm not presenting any views from uh, organization side of you know so sure, if we uh, okay first of all we need to understand like you know how these exposures work let's say if you work with rf so it's it's a power that's like more dangerous than like the you know frequency because let's say you keep working with really really high power or so that's a little bit more dangerous now about the 5g yes the frequency is higher or so now if we talk about like the power let's say you you have a wifi router exactly in front of you or you are staying like let's say 5 feet away same thing with a microwave oven so nearby like devices you get much more exposure like if you move like 2 feet away then your exposure like goes down a lot so the only concern when you know people there is like a lot of myths going going on like you know uh, 5g will create this thing 5g create cancer 5g create brain something blah 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 anyways so it's because of like there will be more number of antennas more number of antennas will produce more amount of radiation and i agree there might be some but again these those are not studied like there there is like if you if you look at you know some if you can find some research articles well again from a reputed sources only not the uh, local journals or something i don't think like you will find a lot of research done on health risks because we are surviving like this 4g and all and if you remember uh, not sure like uh, how old are you but let's say any technology when uh, if you remember if you look at history you know when this 1g network started well there was always contradictions like you know the uh, people will get cancer or people will die and all but we are still surviving so we'll survive i think so it's okay and and also if we talk about risks 
risks are everywhere. So every field has risk. Once like we we'll walk on the street, on can, car can hit you or something. That's a risk. So we don't know. So don't don't worry much about that, and we can't do anything about it. <laughs> okay, sir. So in continuation, I have a one one more question. Sure. Uh, is it too early for these technologies to exist due to the fact that 4G is still is early stages of adoption? Uh, well, 5G will definitely take some time. The reason for 5G is like, as I said, because the frequencies are higher, we require antennas or, or the base station at like closer distances. Now it becomes really, so 5G will only shine in uh, metropolitan areas. Let's say where like the population density is like really high. Uh, because it can provide more number of channels, more number of like, you know, uh, users can connect to it. But 4G is like still will be available and then it's reasonable speeds. Uh, and because like, you know, 5G infrastructure is extremely expensive. So it's not viable to like, you know, net, uh, wireless uh, companies to implement it right away. If they implement like they're going to like raise the cost like to, to the sky. So it will take still take a few years, I believe. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Director, sir, would you like to ask? No, uh, my question, sir, basically is that uh, now we are talking about the 5G. Actually, let's say we are, we are now at present talking in terms of the 6G. So 5G penetration is already there, as you have rightly said, in terms of your urban areas. But right. now the 6G will be there. I think the more important aspect which you have already discussed is that the how you design your switches, how you de design to carry all these multi port switches so that your switching time is less. I think this is the technology we are looking forward and definitely there will be a wide role in terms of 6G and other applications which we are looking for, which is more rather than uh, we are talking in terms of Alexa hardware, we are switching to SDN type of a thing where you really do not need to have such type of hardware and you are working on the SDN. I think this is the technology we should work Oh, uh, that that's that's right. I mean, like I'm uh, really, really worried about. Yeah. So I mean, like there so are. What would be the of this? Sorry, sorry, I didn't get your last. Please. But these, uh, let's say, because ultimately these networks will be shifting to a type of SDNs. Uh -huh. So where in role, where in what type of a role do you think that will be there in terms of once we go to these switching devices, which is mostly driven by a hardware type of a pulse type of thing. Well, uh, I still think like because, you know, if whenever I talk to like some industrial partners or who are like actively working in this like 5G or upcoming 6G kind of, uh, you know, devices. Well, first of all, there is like no kind of strict specifications available for 6G. So it's not like, you know, uh, published yet. So I, I mean, like there are a lot of different technologies that are available right now and which are some promising showing some promising results as well. So what it's just like kind of a speculation that you know it will be like combined with some sort of uh, algorithms or something maybe kind of they will develop uh, some sort of you know different type of technology where they can encrypt or reduce the packet size kind of these type of things as i said i can't really speak about software side of it but like hardware definitely there are companies working really like you know uh, they are trying to really push their products where they can show nanosecond type of time and they are already working towards and yes there is another one is like the photonic integrated circuits kind of thing where most likely things might switch to like where the large bandwidth is required towards photonics because optical provide much more bandwidth much more. right right so i think this is how this will shape up in the coming time so let us see how this evolves and in the coming time, since there will be a lot of technologies which will be, which will be, uh, which we'll be seeing, and uh, there will be lots of change which is going on. So, uh, at the end, I think we have a number of questions. Uh, what is the last uh, section? We, I think, both of things which is to be given by somebody. <laughs> Sham, will you please uh, ask the rest questions of the participants? Yes, ma'am, sure. Uh, we have uh, a question by Somblingo and it says, you have talked about the contribution, but how can the 5G be a loophole to the community and what is the limit of its benefits? Uh, loophole, I, okay, I need to ask like, what exactly you mean by loophole like to the community? I don't, I don't get the question. Do we have the question? Uh, 
speaker over here. So I think by loophole he Sir, means actually that loophole is the term used in India that you have disclosed some technology which is mm -hmm. used in 5G and mm -hmm. how much it is effective, how much it will be effective, your technology will be effective, how much in that communication. I, I can't really uh, talk about like how much it will be effective and all because this is this is all these things like you know uh, okay being like as a I'm just doing my part as a researcher so my task is to design the devices as per the spec so I, I don't right. really want to go about I mean definitely I can present some views but I don't want to on these things. Because I, I, I also agree, like, you know, there is like a lot of talks going between and a lot of like, you know, political things going about 5G, like especially 5G. So there are like tons of things which we just try to avoid talking at all. So uh, some some lingo, right? So sorry about that. I don't think I can talk that, talk about that. Right, right, sir. Now, so many questions were handled. Now, Asta, ma'am, Dr. Asta, please take over for this. Conclude the session now. Yes, sir. Sir, is speaking continuously since last two hours now. Oh, well, speaking is fine. It's, it's you know, like. <laughs> for a very interactive session, sir, really. If you continue for four hours, nobody will get up from here. <laughs> no, no, I'll definitely. Definitely, hold. we have got the good uh, responses and questions in the chat box, and uh, we will be finally concluding now here. So, um, the anchors, please uh, kindly would you tell the information further? And also, I can like you know really talk oh, a lot okay. in the morning. Right now, it's one a.m. at my side, <laughs> and it's raining here in the weather. <laughs> like that. Am I audible? Yes, you are audible. Yes. Okay. So at last, I would like to thank Dr. Sajitha Singh sir, Director sir, Editorial sir, Faculty Coordinator, and just all the members who joined today to make this event a success for them. Before ending the session, I would like to request the audience to open their webcam for a group screenshot. Uh, section, please kindly not share right now the poster. Let's take the screenshot post. I request the audience to open their webcam. Okay, so done. Is the screenshot part done? Better. We should move away now. Move away. Yes. So, uh, person in charge has it done? Great. Saksham, now you can uh, share. The poster and we can conclude rationally please continue now i would like to invite dr asta sharma ma'am to offer a vote of thanks over to you ma'am thank you so much for the thank you so uh, i deem it a great honor to propose the vote of thanks to all those who have helped us in making this international webinar such a memorable experience uh, I, Dr. Asta Sharma, on behalf of EC Department, GLBITM, extend a hearty vote of thanks to our chief guest of the day, Dr. Tejinder Singh, for gracing today's webinar. Thank you for giving such an insightful uh, webinar and amazing talks and showing all your uh, research. And I know that today participants have really learned a lot from this session. So, and thank you for accepting the invitation as well and taking your valuable time from your busy schedule. I would uh, like to express a profound gratitude to our director, sir, Dr. Rajiv Agarwal, sir, for his kind presence in this webinar. 
I would like to thank our HOD sir, Dr. Satyendra Sharma, for his continuous moral support and guidance and providing me the opportunity to organize this webinar. I would like to especially thank the student coordinators, Vaishnavi, Shamli, Shivangi, Saksham, Arshita, Priyam, and Nilav, who have been running around doing a lot of things. Thank you so much for being a great team. I would like to thank all the professors, my colleagues, for encouraging students to participate and also guiding the participants. Finally, the wonderful participants who have turned up in such great numbers, not only nationally, but also globally. Thank you so much for your cooperation. We have received participation from uh, many countries and uh, uh, like United Kingdom, Canada, Ireland, Bangladesh, France, Singapore, Denmark, to name few. Once again, I thank all for your cordial cooperation and making this webinar effective. Hope we will see you soon. That's all for my side. Uh, thank, thank you, Dr. Asad. Thank, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank okay. you so much. Thank you. And any further questions or something, feel free to like shoot an email or something if I can answer that one. Okay. Uh, I can like maybe answer a few questions over there. Okay. Sure. Yes, participants, okay. uh, they have the contact address. They can definitely, sure. and we have the uh, request for sharing the recording as well. So we will be corresponding on the mail. Sure, sure. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank okay. you, sir. Thank you very much. Have a good day, everyone. Bye.